Good morning, we are on Memchas Amud Aleph 48a. So we're learning <clears throat> about some of the achievements of, of Yochanan Kohen Gadol. We explained yesterday, he's positioned just after the Hanukkah revolt during the Hashemunayik uh, dynasty. And he was a leader, Kohen Gadol, a Nasi, was successful in um, bringing together or worked difficult, worked uh, very strongly to bring together Jewish practice, kind of refocus um, spiritual national attention on the temple and Torah observance. So included in that was investigating people's practices with regard to the tithe, and instituted the demai. And now the Gemara is going to tell us, and the mission actually mentioned other things that he did, and they're going to explain them. So it's uh, about uh, a third down from the top of the page, maybe a little bit more. The first word in the line is the gazar. And there's a colon, and then the last two words is va'afu. See it? I'm sorry. The, last, the first word in the line is v'gazar. The last two words in the line is va'afu. That's where we are. There's a colon. And then it says va'afu. A little, a little below a third. Yeah? yeah. Okay. So va'afu, he too, yechen and kong gadol, bitil hama'irim, abolished the waker-uppers. So says the Gemara, my ma'orim, which, which waker-uppers did he abolish? We, we were talking about the people who woke up the high, the priests and the people who woke up the Levites for their work, but this is a different kind of, how would you say it, waker-uppers? In Yiddish you say a veker. That's responsible for... Yeah. So there's the veker. In Yeshiva you had, you had a veker, the guy whose job was to bang on everybody's door to wake them up. So my martyrdom, which which uh, awakeners are these awakeners? So Omar Rachva or Rachava. Rachava said, "Bechol yom v'yom, on each and every day, shayu omdim levim al duchan." When the levim would stand on the platform, that's the word duchan means the platform, and they would stand there and they would sing the. Shir Shalyo in the daily song along with the Karbanis, right? The daily the song of the day that we say every day, right? That comes from the Levites who would sing that. So first they would say Va'imim, they would say, Uda Lama Sishan Hashem. Wake up. Why should God sleep? That's the modern, so to speak, waking up God. That's the that's the implication, which of course should raise your eyebrows. And therefore, Omar Lahen, he said to them, I believe, I'm assuming the Omar Lahen, he said to them, is, is Yechanan going, <clears throat> Yechanan Kohen Gadol saying to them, <laughs> Is there sleep? By, for the omnipresent, that's how Makim, it's a way of referring to God as the omnipresent, the one who's everywhere. And it's appropriate they refer to God as the omnipresent in asking this question, because the, the notion of the omnipresent is that God is equally present everywhere, whereas sleep implies a change, right? So you're cognizant, you're not cognizant, you're conscious, you're not conscious. So is there sleep before the omnipresent? What does this mean you're announcing every morning? Arise, why should God sleep? So first of all, there's the logical question. What does it mean to sleep for God? God's omnipresent. He's unchanging. But in addition, there's a pasuk. That like for Nemar does it not say, Behold, the garden of Israel neither sleeps nor slumbers. So aside for the implication of change in them, the omnipresent doesn't sleep. There's also the scriptural contradiction. One verse says, wake up, why should God sleep? 
And another verse says, Behold, a guardian of Israel does not sleep nor slumber. So what does this mean? Ella, rather, the meaning of this is, is Manchi Yisrael Shri Mitzra Ritzar at a time when the Jewish people are in pain. And idol worshippers, non Jews, the Nachas Vishalva are living happily and peacefully. At such a time, God is asleep, as it were. Therefore, it says, Arise, why should God sleep? So, what's the point of the answer on the basic level? That sleep is not a description of God's behavior. God forbid, God doesn't sleep, nor is he awake. It's a description of his relationship with the Jew. And in the same way, when a person is asleep, they're completely present, but not conscious of their surroundings. So, it is as if God is allowing that which he, quote, wouldn't ordinarily allow, or he's treating us as if he were sleeping in that we're feeling such pain, right? That's or That's like, <clears throat> it's not him who's sleeping, it's because of us and our actions, no? That's right. So it doesn't say when Jews misbehave, he got to sleep. <clears throat> so that's the implication. Right, the Lord doesn't say that, just, but the point is that it doesn't say when Jews, uh, there are there are such places like that, when Jews misbehave, God's asleep, and that leads to the, the affliction. But it's more a description of the Jewish state of existence. If the Jewish Jews are, stating, are in a state of as a depressed state, then the relationship with God is as if, there, as if he's present but sleeping. Right? That's the basic uh, answer here. And that's the description of our relationship with God. And therefore, we're kind of asking that the relationship change. Sorry? Just, and Yochanel Hagadol is asking them to stop asking. And it seems like, change. okay, so it seemed like he's asking them to stop saying that because no, not everybody understands the subtlety. Exactly. And if you remember, Yochanel Kohen Godel, as you mentioned, comes in during the time of the Hashmanayim. The Hashmanayim come right after the Hellenizers, right? That was the battle. The battle was against the Hellenization, the secularization of Jews. In some ways, it was a civil war. Jews against Helen, against Jews against Jews, but Hellenizers versus Jews uh, faithful to Torah observance. So, and that um, helped Hellenizing, the Hellenization of Jews during that period helped, or or was there like the the uh, what's the word, the preamble to the Sadducees that would come later. Many of the Hellenizers who wanted to claim being Jewish but not fully adherent to Jewish observance, claimed to be Sadducees. And that was uh, Sadducees officially the Tzedokim. Tzedokim. Oh. It's English for Tzedokim. And the Tzedokim, they're called Tzedokim because they follow, followed a man named Tzadok, or Baisusim, followed a man named Baisus. And uh, they were people who rejected the authority of the sages and the authority of the oral tradition in general. And they just believed in, in strict script, scripture. Now here too, the, both the verses here are quoted from scripture. So it's not as if, sorry? Samaritans not necessarily. Samaritans, but they, were also... they were questionable conversions to different, they came earlier. Samaritans is earlier under, during Ezra's time. Is reform that, that they follow only the written Torah? No? Okay, so reform, uh, philosophically speaking, I don't think reform is the same way. Necessarily, <laughs> ostensibly, right? Right. Where they hold them today is one thing, but where they were philosophically, hundred years ago, is a little different. Um, but in some degree, it is similar because they, the reformists would have argued the sages interpreted, and now we're interpreting different. Maybe that's what they would have claimed at some point in time. So maybe there is a similarity there. But I, I think, just in general, the the, the Sadducees were some of them were ideological, certainly. But a lot of them were just uh, hanging their hat on that because it was an easier form of Judaism and didn't require all the all the kind of laws. So it was a way of like uh, modernized Judaism, if you will. And perhaps Yechon and Gadol is abolishing the statement because he understands that a lot of people are not going to appreciate the subtlety of what this means that God is asleep. And that it's relative to our relationship with him rather than an absolute statement on God's state of being. 
Maybe that's what um maybe that's what this is. Perhaps you're gonna say Robert. <gasps> Yeah. So ideologically speaking, that was their official stance. But here he's quoting two verses from scripture, right? So they'll have to continue with that also. The, the written Torah talks about Torah Shabbat. Not explicitly. Oh, no. Implicitly. Okay. Not explicitly. That was the whole struggle. Anyway, Nyechen Kren a big part of what he's trying to do, and then later Shim Ben Shetach, was to uh, rid the Jewish establishment of the Sadducees. They infiltrated everything, including the priesthood, including the Sanhedrin even. And these uh, leaders, I, I mentioned yesterday there's different, different views as to who this Yechon and Gadol was, but according to the dominant view, Yechon and Gadol himself later in life became a Sadducee. Yeah, he served as a high priest fighting for all this his whole life and something like 80, 80, 80 years. 80 years, and then at the end of his life became a Sadducee, which is a sad, a sad ending for the sages. They, they really rallied behind him. Anyway, deeper still on this subject of God's sleep, the uh, we we know that the uh, the story of Purim, the story of Purim. When the Postic says Balaila, who on that night the king couldn't sleep. Right? And he asked for the chronicles to be read, and he just remembered that he that Mordechai saved him and no one ever, he was never repaid. Right. So at that point, our custom is to the reader, we he starts to read out loud louder. He goes to a higher note than Balaila who. Why? Because it's tuck vishalness. The, the thrust, the main thrust and the strong point in the miracle, the turning point in the miracle is this point when the king can't sleep and calls in the chronicle, have, have the chronicles read and remember that Mordechai saved him. And so this addresses the question that many commentaries address, which is why the story of Mordechai being, having saved the king and then riding on, being paraded around as a hero is actually a side story. If that didn't happen, the results of the main part of the story, which is the Jewish survival is the same. It's a side story. The main point of the story is Queen Esther became queen. She was convinced to, she used the opportunity to talk to the king and change his mind. That would have happened whether or not was Mordecai was paraded as a savior of the king. It's, it's a side narrative. So why is that tugfishalness? Why is that the thrust of the miracle? So on a simple level, it's because it changed the perspective, perspective of the Jews. Before them, the Jews were downtrodden and now the Jews are something to be proud of. So, like, uh, sociologically, it has this, like, effect psychologically on the Jews that they feel more proud of who they are because they see their leader being paraded as opposed to being under the boot of this decree, right? So there's that, like, uh, the, the public image changes in that narrative. But in terms of, like, the direct, the basic story of Jewish survival, it's not a necessary component of the story. So it explains Hasidus that we know that whenever the... Megillah says the word the king without saying Achashverosh the king it's actually a reference to God even the word Achashverosh is a reference to God right the word Achashverosh is combined of Achris Veresh's Shaloi at the beginning and end belongs to him it's an allusion to God so the king throughout the story on its deeper level is actually Hashem and there's the miracle that on that night the king couldn't sleep Hashem couldn't sleep because ordinarily, as we're learning here, the Jews are in a, state, in a depressed state, spiritually and therefore physically also. Hashem is asleep. And ordinarily, what's required is that the Jew wake up, and then that elicits from Hashem the waking up. And that's kind of perhaps what the Levim are doing. The Jews have woken up for serving Hashem, and that's the Levim's way of proclaiming to Hashem, we're in the service of you. And therefore, respond not in a slumber state but in a wake state and here comes the miracle on Purim that even though the Jews were not in a up state, they were in a depressed state nonetheless the king couldn't sleep that, that, that deep relationship that Hashem has with the Jew that even when he's not behaving and even though it's in a sleep state he still can't sleep 
until he finds, oh, there's a Jew who saved the king. The Jew who needs to be paraded. And that's why it changes. That, that's why it's the type of Shinnah. That's why it's the thrust of the miracles. That's the turning point. When Hashem says, even though the Jews may be not worthy, but they're still my people, he can't sleep. And that's perhaps the deeper meaning here of what's happening, that the Levim are being told, or the Levim make this declaration first thing in the morning, Hashem, we're here to serve you. We're awake. Right? Right? There's a famous Pasuk that says this quote also. I sleep in exile. But the Libi air, my heart is still awake. Uh, right? The Pasuk says, I need air. Explain, I I'm asleep in Golos. But Libi air, the Torah Mitzvah, my heart is still awake for Torah Mitzvah. Because even as a Jew is a state of exile, even when a Jew is a state of negativity, there's still a part of him that's attached to Hashem. So even as Hashem is asleep, there's still a part of Hashem that's not asleep, as it were. And that's the, the great miracle that Hashem could not sleep at night. But it would seem that this subtlety was far was beyond the people of the time, and therefore Yechonah and Gadol in trying to consolidate the Jewish observance around the temple removed this practice. Okay. On a similar note, the Mark continues. The Mishnah told us, Ve'esanoikfim, and Yechon and Kohen Gadol also abolished the strikers. That's one translation, strikers. So what are the Nekfin? My Nekfin? What are these Nekfin? Sorry? Yeah, we're going to see in a minute what they are. So my Nekfin, what is this practice of the Nekfin, the, the strikers, or the... As we'll see in a moment. Omar Rav Yehuda Amar Shmuel. Rav Yehuda explained the name of Shmuel. Shahayu Misartin, they would, when they wanted to get the animal that they were about to sacrifice, Rashi picks on the eagle or on a calf, they wanted to get him to crouch so that they can properly slaughter the animal. So they wanted to do, they wanted to do that with the least amount of resistance from the animal. So what would they do? They would scratch the eagle to the calf the Gemara mentions eagle. They wanted to scratch the they scratched the calf, being kind of between its its um, horns. Today, so that dam blood should flow beinov into their eyes, and that way the animal wouldn't see what's going on and not and not be able to resist when it was pushed down and slaughtered. And also ihu. Rechen and Kadal came along, who bottle and abolished it. Why? Because it seems like a blemish. Even though there's, it's not halakhically or technically a blemish, but it, um, it gives the appearance of a blemish. And because of the appearance, he uh, abolished it. So you see again this thread where Rechen and Kadal is like, is like protecting Judaism, so to speak, from those who might claim that this is going awry, right? This is, it's, it's a lack of strong leadership. And people are like, oh yeah, they're not taking it seriously. Anyway, look, they do this. And yeah, they, they claim to be all religious, but look, they're, 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 their animals aren't perfect. So Yechon Gadol said, okay, done. we're not doing that anymore. So there's a strict, strong presentation of wholesomeness. The Gemara continues, Masnisa Tana, and the Mishnah was taught that this noikfim is not scratching between the, the eyes, between the horns to get blood into the eyes so that the animal crouches without much resistance. But rather, show you actually actually would strike it with, with um, stick. stick. <clears throat> As people used to do it to idol, when they would worship idol worlds, when they would worship idols to knock it to the ground. And Amr Lahen, so Yechen and Gadol, and Gadol told them, How long are you going to be offering? Nevelos means um, Nevelos means carcasses that are unslaughtered. So a dead animal is not slaughtered. Not ritually slaughtered. Why are you offering such animals to the altar? The Gemara interjects and says Nevelos? What do you mean? They, were, they didn't strike it to death. They striked it till it fell down and then they slaughtered it. So why are you calling it Nevelos? Nevelos is a description of animals who died not by ritual slaughter. 
So nevelos hashachaklu, they're they're slaughtering it. Why are you calling it nevelos? And rather, it should read trefos. And trefos. It, so tre, we use the word trefos to describe anything that's not kosher, but tref actually means an animal who is injured to the point that it's going to die within a year. So what are they worried about? You're striking it over the head. Shemanikov krum shomas beach. Shalmoyach, lest they puncture the skull of the animal. And if you puncture the skull of the animal, then it's eventually going to die anyway. And that's, that's the trefa, and therefore ritually impure. Sorry? It's a blemish, but even more than that, it's, it's a trefa. Uh, actually, it, aren't mums only public, th visible things? Isn't a blemish only visible things? Internal things is, is trefa, isn't that right? I'm pretty sure mum is only external things, only things that are visible. Sorry? I was just thinking that a puncture in the head would qualify as a blemish. No, if it's not visible, I don't think it's a blemish. Only to consider a trefa. If I'm not mistaken. If I'm not mistaken, blemishes are limited to things that are only visible. It's, I, I'm quite sure that mum is always limited to only things that are visible, which is why they, if a blood in the eyes looked like a blemish, even though technically it wasn't. I'm no. pretty sure blemishes are limited to things that are visible. Here, the issue is a trefa. So, because of this, Ahmad he got up. Yochanan going well got up. Vehiskin and established lahem for them tabois bekarkar rings in the ground, and that's the way they would hold the animals down. So perhaps, yes, to put the neck of the animal animal there. So we have two versions here as to what the night from are. One is they would scratch it on the head until blood would come down to its eyes, and that would make it fall to the ground. And the other is that you're banging on the head and that way make it come to the ground. And in both cases, Yechon and Kangal says, it's going to look like a mum or it's going to look like a, it's going to be a, it might be a trefa and therefore he gave them rings. And it's like what the, they used to do to the idols. And right? and, and that just, you know, these, the idol worshippers, yeah. Oh, at least with the hitting on the head. Yeah, right. There's again, the perception again, that, that issue of perception. So perhaps on a deeper level, what this means is something like this. Perhaps we, we've discussed this before that the idea of the carbon, the idea of the offering, is the on a personal level is meant to elevate the animal. Right? We all the animal then the, the biological urges that we have as human beings. And the idea of the carbon is to elevate that. That with it, our biological human urges, our animalistic urges, our animal soul in the language of Tanya, be elevated and offered in the temple. So I eat, yes, but I eat fresh. I sleep, yes, I sleep for Hashem. I have a family, yes, but I have a family for Hashem. So they're regular human animalistic tendencies, but they're offered to Hashem. And the question is, now, now the act of elevation is in the ritual slaughtering. It's in the shechita. That's the moment. As the, the language in the Gemara is, in the shechat elo mashach. Shechita must be done with drawing. Right? That's the, physically, the, the act, the, you can't press the knife down on the animal or hack at it, you have to draw, move from one end to the other. That's the halacha. So explains chassid this. Mashach means to draw it in. You have to draw the animal in, that it be elevated. The animal soul, as opposed to hack at it. Meaning, don't fast, but eat for Hashem. Right? Fasting would be to hack at your animal soul. To draw it in means to elevate it, to eat fresh. Air. Now, the question is, how do you draw them in? How do you draw the animal soul in? So the old way used to be strike it. To look at yourself in the mirror and say, you're terrible, you're selfish, you're a horrible person. Until he submits and says, okay, we have to serve Hashem. Right? Came to Yechenem and Zakai and said, Came, I'm sorry, Yochan Gagadol and said, it's a new time, it's a new generation now. We need to ring them in. You have to be excited about uh, in English, you know, ring them in. Taba, something that's um something that's more uh, attractive to the animal. Instead of looking in the mirror and saying, You're a terrible horrible person, because you're full, you're all selfish, look in the mirror and say, the most beautiful thing to do is to serve Russia. The most beautiful way to eat is to serve Russia. It's the most beautiful way to have a family. It's the most beautiful way to live. Drawing it in by ringing it in 
rather than by banging it on the head till it submits to being elevated. Maybe that's the, maybe that's what's uh, underlying this on the on a, on a spiritual personal level. Okay. I, I don't have this full picture to my head, but something with the blood in the eyes, something to the effect of blood represents the passion, right? That's the, that's the, right. That's how they would uh, sprinkle the blood on the altar, because the the blood, the passion of the animal soul is being offered on the altar, and the eyes is the source of lust and desire. Right? So somehow they're like making the passion run through the eyes, as if this something. I, I'm not, I don't have my finger fully on it, but something. Along those lines is where, where what I see in that something to do with um, like you almost become blinded by passion. You demonstrate how the passion itself is making you so blind. Right? Initially, it's the eyes lusts and the passion starts to boil. But if you scratch a little bit beneath the surface, you can use that metaphor of scratching. Then it, it, it blinds you itself. The blood itself runs through the eyes. Something like that. Yeah. 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 So the eye sees lusts and gets the passion going. But if you do it long enough, the blood starts to run through the eyes and the person becomes blind. Can't see what's what. Right? But you're going to come about changing that and giving it a more, more positive way of alluring the animal in. Perhaps. Well, during the time he was very successful until the end of his life, but it was very successful. He was very successful, yeah. It seems that he's very successful. The most most Jews were observant, and the sages had quite a strong power at the time until later in his life. And then when he died, things changed. It was. Yanai, who killed a bunch of sages, we talked about him earlier. Yanai, the, the one who was questionable with his lineage and by the Hakel myth business. Remember that? Where the sages came and said, Don't worry, you're one of us. And uh, this guy whispered in his oh, ear, yeah. saying, and he yeah. became a herit. That This is right after that time. So Jews went back and forth. And then you had Shlom Tziana Malka, who was more positive, and then it became negative under her children. It was all kinds of infighting. And then the Romans said, okay, enough with all you. And that was it. So, but Jehan and Khan Gadol certainly, at least while he was good, it represents a time in this period when Jews were observant and actually uh, powerful also. They expanded the borders of Israel. They did very well. Right, right after, this, is, this is like the, the post hashmanaic independence, at least under Jehan and Khan Gadol, was at least for that time, was Torah observant. Okay, so let's conclude now until the Mishnah. The Mishnah also said earlier, Ad Yomov Hoyapatish Makabir Shalayim. Again, this is Yechon and is dealing with issues of perception and the way people are referring to them. So the Mishnah said, until his day, a hammer could be heard in Jerusalem. The Mishnah didn't explain what it meant. So the Gemara explains, during Chal Hamoyed. We explain this when we learned the Mishnah, but it comes from this little line of the Gemara, which essentially is, and during the intermediary days of Yom Tif, right between the first days and the second days, it's called Cholamayit, which is like Chayla means the holiday of the the mundaneness of the holiday. So there are the ordinary restrictions of the Lam Tesvalachis, thirty nine works, are not forbidden. One can do such work, but one is not to do any work that's extra. Namely, you can only do work that if you didn't would cause you a loss. But you cannot go out of your way to do new business. So, a guy who has a uh, is a oh, sorry, yeah, a pot maker of some sort, blacksmith. blacksmith. So, if someone comes to him with a pot that's broken, and he needs to cook on Yom Tif, he'll fix it, right? Because he needs to. So coming to Jerusalem, which is where everybody's hanging out now, it's the holiday. Everybody's there. You can hear walking on the market. You can hear clanking of the hammer. Because why not? But he abolished it. Because oh, he, the abolished subtle, he abolished that. Because the 
the subtleties of knowing what type of banging is considered work because you're protect, you're protect, saving a loss versus making new pots. Who understands that? Who knows that till today? It's an issue people aren't very clear on. So he said, okay, we're closing shops for holidays. It can also be very tempting. I'm already fixing one pot. And yeah, I'm exactly right. More money. What's the difference, you know? That's correct. He was the Kohen Gadol. He was the high priest and the, well, the high priest he also, a, uh, he was exactly the Nasi. I was going to say the high priest at that time, like Shimon HaTzadik before him, the high priest at the time was basically political power, was a political position as well. Right. For better or for worse, yeah. sorry, sometimes they were bought, sometimes they were righteous, sometimes the Sadducees bought their way in, especially under the Romans later, but this is not during Roman occupation. No, no, this, this is between Greek and Roman occupation. Before the Hasmonean. This is during the Hasmonean. Corruption. The corruption already begins already at this point. The corruption is beginning, but yeah. But he had the authority. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So the high priest did have, have political power as well. As did, uh, was it Eliezer Herkinus, was it? And Shimon Tzadik and others. They were the Nazi as well. They had political power as well. Yeah, which isn't which is necessarily a good thing, by the way. It's supposed to be a split. There was it's supposed to be separation of power. Sanhedrin does exist at this time. They 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 didn't, they, have, they didn't have political power, like depending on when, depending when. So they were making a lot of rulings. Doesn't necessarily mean that was following them. They didn't necessarily have the, the ability. In other words, the Sanhedrin the, the Sanhedrin didn't go around here investigating Meiser. Yechen can guddled it, even though there was a functioning Sanhedrin here. Yaisi ben Yezer, when Ataya Bailey, somewhere around that time. Sorry? The proper, the proper separation of power. Sorry. The proper separation of power, as Torah, as Torah wants it, which is king, high priest, Sanhedrin. Three different branches of government. The executive, the, the judiciary, and the legislative, the Sanhedrin, judiciary, and Senate legislative, the executive, and the ritual. He's being all three. three. Two of them, for sure. It's dicey. It's dicey. So it's not. It's not so. Which is why, by the way, many were not very happy with the Hashmonaim. Many were not so happy with the Hashmonaim because they didn't properly they didn't properly restore Jewish governance. It's correct. Moreover, they were Kohenim, and the Kohenim are not supposed to be kings. They're supposed to go to Yehuda, Shevet Yehuda. This is one of the reasons. This is why one of the, this is one of the reasons why. In Mishnah, you don't have the laws of Hanukkah. Because Yehuda Nasi comes from the line of Judah, who's supposed to be the Nasi, supposed to be the political leader, slash king, didn't like the fact that the Hashemunayim were kings, considering the corruption that happened very, very quickly. That this probably led to the corruption. This is part of that. That's correct. That, this, this all fits nicely in the theme here as well. That's right. One of the things Yanai wants, we learned oh, earlier, Yanai wants... Chaotic ruling right. system. One of the one of the things Yana wants is to be also high priest. One of the things he wants to also be high priest. That was the question of lineage: is his mother Jewish, not Jewish? What's the story? Right? It's all in that same era, time period. What do you want to say? I just he doesn't. It says like what he said and all that, but he doesn't face any resistance from any other groups or. or this not during like his time. Late. Well, obviously he does because later in his life he becomes a Sadducee. At least according to the more popular version right of who Yechonik and Gadol was. Goes with what he says. Sorry? Everyone just goes with what he says now? Certainly cer certainly those who are Torah observant would, yeah, and most would, yeah. I, it seems that most Jews were followers of the of the, of the the sages, but they weren't necessarily educated or inclined to understand what was really going on. Okay. They were simpletons, and these are the Torah leaders. This is the Sanhedrin they followed. Then you had others. Depending oh, who was he's king. In the Sorry? He's in the no, he's a high priest. Okay. But there is a Sanhedrin at the time. Okay. It, it, this is either it's during the time or right near the time of the Zogos. We have the pairs. We have like the Av Bezdin and the head of the Sanhedrin, like the two positions there. Anyway, okay, final line from the Gemara. The last thing the Mishnah said was, The Mishnah said that during his lifetime, um, one didn't have to ask about demai, meaning if you bought produce from someone else who was an Orthodox Jew, you knew that he gave the records a tithe. And the Kedah Amran, as you mentioned before, the Gemara explained before, that he, because he investigated and found that someone doing my sir, he instituted that if you are scrupulous, you should you should um, take tithe when you buy from someone who you don't know. So then when you buy from someone you know, you'd have to be worried that he didn't give the tithe. 
you know he did. So if you buy from a cover from someone who's an Orthodox Jew, even if he may have bought it from someone else who isn't, you know for sure that he would have given the requisite tithe. That is the conclusion of this section of the Gemara's commentary on history, um, which is Yechon and Gadol. Tomorrow we're going to get on to the end of the Sanhedrin and some other things, different points in history when different things stopped considering the changes in Jewish leadership. Have a wonderful day. <laughs>